So he started very early to tell me about the world and how interesting it is. Now, this is a little trickier. Who is saying that? Who is saying, so he started very early to tell me about the world and how interesting it is? Talk about that in your group for a second. I think it's the child. I love how, the um, is the how you're fixating on the pronouns there and on the importance of that text structure. What I find with high schoolers even is that when they see a pronoun, they almost have have trained themselves to skip it and like to not really think about what that refers to, but that's so often the key to a complex text, like who is this referring to, um, especially, say, for poetry. And if they aren't really well trained from an early age to be thinking about pronouns in a really careful way, then they'll grow up to just not even read them. It's like they don't even see them on the page. Right, I, I, absolutely. And, and the early age would be before fifth grade. Yeah. Um, the early age could, could be kindergarten. And there's two parts to this. There's, one, there's actually research to show that weaker readers have difficulty with pronoun reference, with any kind of antecedent reference um, weaker readers have, have trouble with. So pointing that out helps the weakest readers. And it, it, it also, in addition to getting settled as to who's talking to who at this, at this point in the text, if you don't know that, if you don't, if you don't know that Feynman is narrating, but he's narrating from the perspective of looking back into his, early, into his earlier childhood, then the rest of the text gets, gets confusing. So these early questions have to be, sometimes they're very easy. This one wasn't. This was not necessarily an easy question. But sometimes it's okay to ask an easy question in the beginning for two reasons. It, it, gets, it gets, or three reasons really. It orients everybody. It lets you know who might be completely lost. And it also builds confidence. So you're coming in from the outside into this classroom. Um, if you were coming into a classroom with a different composition, different kinds of kids, you know, uh, different SCS, whatever, uh, would you change your approach? Would you change the lesson plan? No, not, not at all. Um, the, the, this type of lesson is designed to support all students. And in this class, there were a number of students on, on IEPs. And there were, in fact, you may see a second adult there, and a second adult, uh, in addition to the teacher, that I don't know if she came in the video, but there are a number of children on IEPs, and there are a number of children who are very, who are struggling readers. And the multiple reading supports that. The constantly going back into the text and asking the students to look at the text and underline supports, supports these weaker students. So, and any heterogeneous class that, in, which are many of our elementary school classes, are going to have some very weak readers, so, whether they have IEPs or not. And this lesson, these types of lessons, and these, with the multiple readings, with the support for vocabulary, with the working in groups, with the going back into the text, are all designed to support a wide, wide range of readers. I think that you gave excellent support for the students with the constant rereading, and it wasn't like you had them to read the whole thing over, but you would give a question and then have them to go back and reread that specific paragraph. And I know a lot of teachers are questioning, like, what does a close reading look like? And this is an excellent example of how you can do that in the classroom. One of the things I found helpful, actually, since this, is to have a very straightforward model for, for answering these questions. Go back and reread the section of the text that addresses the question. After rereading, stop and think about it. Now, th th and then, then, then talk to your talk to your group, and then write. Reread, think, talk, and write. Because it's very difficult to write about what you can't what you can't speak. But I've also found that the kids, when you say after they reread it, they'll go in and they'll reread it. But then they want to talk right away. They don't want to stop and think, or or even stop and jot down some notes. So I've suggested to teachers that they have either a bell or they put on some soft music, and it's the thinking time. And during that interval of one minute or two minutes, whatever they think is appropriate for the grade and for the text, um, that's the thinking and writing time, the thinking and jotting down your notes time. And no talking to the group until the bell is rung or until the music stops or whatever it is. And that's been very, very helpful. But that whole system of reread, think, write, and talk has been has has supported the weaker readers, and that's so opposite of what we're doing in a lot of cases, and so opposite of what the kids want to do. Uh, you know, they want it, you know, uh, now, and to uh, 
to get them in the habit of stopping and thinking uh, before they talk or write, that's, that, that's a big thing. And it's really tempting for teachers in the upper grades especially, but for all grades, when you have a classroom that's well managed and the kids are discussing and like three or four of your students really get the text and they're having a great discussion and you have the occasional chime in, but you didn't make anyone think beforehand, you have no way of knowing if yeah. the kids who aren't speaking, if they're thinking. Um, right. And like you could have someone like Amud come in and say, this classroom looks great because like the discussion seems so interesting, but you know, the ratio of like y your work uh, to their work can be so low and you'd never know if they don't have to, everyone writes down their thoughts and you can walk around and check and see, wow. Um, so um, he didn't say anything, but he's way off base and I can tell from his writing. That's very true. And, and what the teacher does as they walk around is essential. And another thing that's essential for the teacher to know is if you've got six, six or seven questions on a complex text like this, which is complex for fifth grade, and the questions are very rigorous, you don't wait until after all six or seven questions are done to go over each one. Mm -hmm. You use your judgment, and after they've done one or two questions and you've walked around, then you stop everybody and you go over question one. Waiting for question six or seven would take which would mean, which would mean, because this should be done over the course of a week. It's a, it's clearly a week long, forty five minutes a day, maybe twenty five minutes in the morning, twenty minutes in the afternoon, over a course of at least four and likely five, likely five days, easily five, counting the culminating activity. Who would like to address this question of what was the lesson that you think his father was trying to teach Richard Feynman about the patterns? He was teaching patterns. Okay, anybody want to add? Um, he was also teaching him about colors. So we have colors, patterns. Anybody want to add to that? Maybe he was teaching him like how to think like a scientist because like usually scientists would think about like how to set things up in certain ways so that it would work for them. Very good. So you have a range of answers that are indicative of fifth grade. As you said, Monica, they can be very, some of them are very concrete. He's teaching him about shapes. He's teaching him about colors. So on the continuum of concrete to abstract, you have colors to the scientific method. Essentially, two kids were talking about how, to, how he teaches like a scientist, think like a scientist. That's quite a range from colors to the scientific method in one class. Now, what I should have done here, in, in, if, I, if I was not trying to maybe cover, maybe cover a little bit too much because, it was because of the taping, was stop, put on, put on the whiteboard all of these answers from colors to the scientific method. And at that point, I would have done a lesson on concrete and abstract. Which of these can you see, feel, hear, and touch? Which can you not see, feel, hear, and touch? And then I would have gone from there, after, after making that hierarchy on the whiteboard, I said, is it possible, is there something that encompasses all of this, that encompasses colors, shapes, the scientific method, and is even more important than all of it, and I had answered that question, nobody would have gotten it. Not one kid would have gotten that. But number one, that's okay, because to have them wrestle with it and then address it is still worthwhile. I could have then, I would have then gone on and said, in there is a sentence, there's one sentence that tells, that tells you the one thing that covers all of these that are on the whiteboard. And that's the sentence that says, at a very early age, he tried to tell me how wonderful, how the world works and how wonderful it is. At that point, most of the groups would have landed on that sentence. And the point is to bring them step by step by step through the text to that conclusion. It's not radically different than what teachers do, good teachers do, except that they have to wrestle with it first and they have to use the text as much as possible. First, let's start with, well, what do you think that sentence means? Everything he, talk in your group, everything he read to me, he would translate as best he could into some reality. About the dinosaur, he might want to know like more about how tall it is and he can put it into reality so that he can understand more about it. I noticed that at first the questions were text-based and very much like, what is this? And then as they go on, they're still very text-based, but they're higher up on blooms. Um, right. So how did you structure that, does he want? Uh, that's designed to, to start, the, the questions in the beginning are designed to set the stage so that the, that the kid has a basic idea of what's happening, 
who's talking, and, and as we discussed earlier, that it's a, the adult father reflecting back on his life in the sure, third I'm person. Sure the mechanics of the text. Yes, yes, and, and also to get, to get some confidence going. Mm -hmm. And then you move into increasingly more abstract um, or higher order, as you say, Bloom's type, higher on the Bloom's hierarchy questions. And that's, that's partly by design, and that's partly, after all, we are talking about a th the world's most renowned theoretical physicist, so he tends to get abstract fairly quickly. So it's partly by design and partly the nature of the text. What do you think about the situation where teachers start this and it, it, it goes awry? They, they have trouble with it, the kids have trouble with it, and they then might, in fact, even say, I, I can't do this. This is too much for me or too much for my kids. Whenever I've seen lessons fall apart or I've taught lessons that have fallen apart and then I, I sit down and weep and then I try to figure out what went wrong, I, usually, the, by far and away, the, the, the biggest culprit is I tried to push too much too fast. That's by far the biggest problem. When I see this, the, the, the students are struggling too much, right, you want that. You want that edge. You want that edge between uh, instruction and frustration. You know. You want the. You want to ride that razor's edge. You want. You want them challenged, but you don't want to frustrate them to the point where you're getting nowhere. And uh, and often where I find a lesson falling apart is because I've tried to push too far too fast. And if I'd have just backed off and said, okay, I can use another day to do this. You know, I can take some more time. Let me take ten more minutes on this. Uh, then, I, then I think that would solve many of the issues.